Mobile One The Grid roars into action with the thunder from down under as the Australian supercars get ready for their biggest race, Bathurst. A 1,000 kilometre endurance race on an unforgiving mountain circuit, the Bathurst 1000 is the ultimate supercar battleground and Walkinshaw and Dritty United are aiming for back-to-back -back victories. From the first practice to qualifying to the top 10 shootout, who's going to be quickest there? and then the gruelling race for over six hours. Bath is the holy grail of Australian motorsport and you know there's something going to be etched in history. Everyone knows how special that mountain is and that racetrack is. Uh, and there's not a single person who's involved in motorsport in this country that doesn't want to, at some point in their career, be involved in either as a team or as a driver standing on the top step of that podium at 6pm on a Sunday afternoon in October. Under the Holden Racing banner, the team won seven times on Mount Panorama. Nick Perkat remembers how he helped them to victory as Garth Panda's co-driver back in 2011. Probably no idea how he did it. <laughs> During my first stint it was like, uh, Nick, we need you to go faster. And I was just petrified. I'll never forget the car coming down pit lane for the first time. Driver change goes well, which was the first tick. And then I think the last hour or so when I was back in the pits watching on the monitors, I was getting paler by the moment, realising what was happening. One of the closest finishes we had at Bathurst at the time. and then. Being an Adelaide boy to win it and the first rookie in 30 odd years, it was just unbelievable. It took another 10 years, but in last season's race, the team scored win number eight. The 2021 Bathurst 1000 winner is Chaz Moster. For the whole team and their boss, the son of original founder Tom Walkinshaw, it was a day to remember. That mountain is really what brought my dad into Australia. The businesses that we are today still stems from that one weekend when my dad decided he was going to go and race a Jag on that mountain with a bunch of Aussies. So it's got a, a big sentimental value to me. Winning Bathurst always means a lot to everyone, but it's especially important to me and my family when we managed to do it. At Bathurst, you need so many things to go right and not necessarily always the fastest car around there wins the race, but the, the car and the team performed unbelievable all day, didn't put a foot wrong and i um, very proud. And one of my highlighted career wins. Mostert and Perkat's victories, although a decade apart, will provide vital experience as they lead two Holden Commodore crews on the mountain once again. It's unreal to race a supercar around there. You've got a nice big heavy supercar floating across the top of the mountain. And then you're trying to pull it up, coming down the hill through the S's, come into the, the dipper there. It's just all these corners are just hero corners and you see the first lap time come up on the dash and you're probably five, six seconds away from where you need to be and you go, how am I going to go faster than that? Driving back there is scary. You never feel like you do the perfect lap. Doesn't matter if you're fast or slow, the effort to do the lap and the risk level is absolutely huge. And it just feels like you're floating with a little bit of grip and you're just managing the car to the walls and maximizing the track limits you have. And it's one where every time you cross the line, even in the race, you're like, okay, let's uh, gear up for another lap here. There is 99 things that can go wrong for you there and one thing that can go right. I've been lucky enough to do it a couple of times now and, and obviously Nick's been lucky to do it as well but you always think, like, I've done it once, I can do it again, but geez, it can just hurt you for so many years. The 11th event of 13 on this year's Supercars calendar, it's a championship in itself and will leave one team claiming a place in mountain history. Something very special when you bring the Peter Brock trophy into the workshop and it sits there for 12 months before, it's unfortunately you've got to pry it out of your hands to go back to the track to see who's going to win it the following year. The team's full of confidence going into this year. We know we had a quick car there last year. I think anyone's a shot for it, but yeah, we're definitely in the mix. I think even winning a championship, I'm not sure it would come close to what you'd feel in that last hour and, and the emotion of crossing the line driving the car. To win it again, being the main guy, would be the best achievement of my career by a long, long way. It's a game of survival. And it's very, very important that we go in humble and focus on doing all the small things right because you only need one mistake and it ruins your whole race weekend there. Fingers crossed, but yeah, we uh, definitely want to win it again. F1 now as we ask the champion-elect about two races he sensationally aced last season. At the end of October, the F1 Circus heads to North America for back-to-back -back US and Mexican Grand Prix. The first of these will be the second race in the States this season. I always enjoy driving in the US. I think it's a very cool place and also we really needed to expand there a bit because F1 was still not fully known. And I think we're doing a good job, of course. It's very important, I think, for F1 in general to be more popular in the US. I think uh, Netflix already helped a lot with the series. From next year onwards, we'll have three races in three different states. So I was always excited to, to come back. I always enjoyed going to Austin, but last year was 
incredible. The amount of people who came to the race and also in the city, how busy it was, was another level for us in the US. So it's on a good track and um, hopefully even more. Last season, the Dutchman's quick-fire victories in Austin and Mexico City proved critical in his surge towards a maiden driver's title, which he won by just eight points. Looking back at it, at the time they were extremely important because I think already at the time we were not the quickest anymore. From all the races so far in, in Mexico, we've always been really competitive. It's just because of the altitude and the car suiting that track, I think, quite well. But that win in uh, Austin was incredibly important. All the races you have won are, of course, incredibly important, but it was a very tough one because when you look back at that race with the strategy and stuff, trying to keep the lead, it was uh, very challenging. But uh, now when I look back at it, it was a really enjoyable weekend. This year, Verstappen has been a winning machine and has the chance to break the single season record of 13 victories. The tracks in Texas and Mexico will provide him with very different tests as he chases history. The track in Austin for me is really enjoyable. The first sector is amazing, it's super fast. And it's a very new track, but it has a lot of old school corners in it. And I think as a driver, that's what we like, and especially in a front car comes alive in the high speed corners. So Mexico is actually very different because of the altitude. There's a lot less downforce on the car. So it always feels very slippery when you're driving there and it's not easy to really get the best out of your car. Everything is running hot, brakes, engine. It is always a very tough weekend, but somehow yeah, it always suits us and I enjoy driving there. It feels a bit like a bit of a go-kart track, if I'm honest, but it's also great to see. You know, Now I also have Checo as a teammate was being Mexican. There's a lot of Red Bull uh, gear on the grandstand, so that's, that's amazing to see. Sports car racing next as we catch up with the bad boys from Detroit. Corvette racing are one of the mainstays of the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Win or lose, and they've won a lot over the last two decades. The current drivers of the famous number three car wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I grew up around IMSA watching my dad compete um, in the early to mid-90s. So for me, IMSA is one of the best sports car series in the world. I love the racing, I love the style of racing that we have here. You can really battle rubbing as racing in America, so I love that aspect of it. I love our restarts that bring intensity, the late races. You always feel like you have a shot to win one of these events, even if you don't have the fastest car. So for me, I love the sport. I think IMSA developed uh, a series where everything is very very consistent. We all had better and worse years in, in car counts and everything, but IMSA always seems to have really good numbers. So I love that I race for Corvette because the main championship was here and, and I always love to race here, not only because of the racetrack, the whole race environment is really, really nice. I like the way the races work here with so many yellows and, and strategy is also important. The way they run the race with, with the yellows, as opposed to safety cars in, for example, the WEC, just makes for spectacular racing. Race restarts at the end of races, Daytona, Sebring. It's just a great show and it's also nice to constantly have a chance to fight for position and for the fans as well. It, it's super nice to see. And then also the way they kind of interact with the fans in the paddock, but not only on track, but also off track feels more open than some of the series I race in, in Europe, so I really love it out there. IMSA is famous for its friendly paddock and driver access, putting the fan experience first, but the level of drivers is second to none, with some of the best international talent, as well as young racers coming over from single-seaters. You see a wide range of drivers, young guys coming in from the junior formulas in America that some guys try to go to IndyCar, they don't make it, come over to our side. And it's cool to see those guys grow in our sport because in sports car racing, you can't have a long career. And I think guys get kind of focused on open wheel at a young age. And once they kind of see the sports car career path, it opens a lot of eyes and, and you can have a long career here, which is amazing. With a mix of sprint and endurance events, IMSA races on the best tracks in North America. And although few would be suitable for Formula One, when you have legendary venues like Daytona, Sebring, Laguna Seca, Canadian Time Motorsport Park, Road America and Watkins Glen, great racing is always guaranteed. The talk of the day is always track limits, track limits, track limits, and here you just have natural track limits, except for Kota, but everywhere else, if you go off, you have a problem. And in my opinion, that's the way it's supposed to be. Of course, there's a lot to say about safety, but I'm not sure that always having this much runoff is actually so much safer. I mean, we still see big crashes in Spa, 
and it's not like Sebring is terrible for big crashes. So in the end, I just love this way more. It's old school racing, and that's the way it's supposed to be. I always love to be here. I mean, I like this kind of racing, so looking forward to be able and lucky to be able to run the best championship on the best racetracks here in America. I feel like lately this is where I belong. People love racing in America. It's all I really know. I've only really done Le Mans in Europe, so I haven't traveled a ton, but I do love the racetracks we have here. It's all old school. Some of them might not be the safest racetracks, but I think as a driver, you respect that. You like being on the limit. It makes it that much more of a challenge and that much more rewarding when you do complete a great lap or a great race. So I love racing in America. I know all the Europeans that come over here love it as well. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. We head to the USA now to meet a Cup Series crew chief promoted into a new role. For 2022, NASCAR powerhouse team SHR decided to make Mike Bogoravich their director of performance, working across all four of their next-gen Ford Mustangs. I'm learning it as I go a little bit. It's a new role. There's, there really was no definition to it when we started, um, other than just go out and help the teams and help find speed. And I've had my hands in anything from vehicle dynamics work and simulator to parts and pieces. I try and come to the track, keep a close relationship with the teams, as well as work with my group back at the shop. Those guys are trying to work ahead and come up with ideas for setups moving forward and help get our teams a good start before they head to the racetrack or before they start looking at it themselves. I moved them up to just try to help the performance of our, of our group and try to, to, to get stuff done quicker. He has worked with a lot of the guys on the team as part of the team, so he's got a great relationship with them. I think it was just trying to make our team stronger. Doug is one of those guys that pours his heart and soul into every project he's a part of. And I think this is a challenge for him that he'll excel in. I think it'll put a lot of pressure on him, but he's somebody that kind of thrives in that pressure. He likes trying to figure out how to not only make one car fast, but now he's going to try to figure out how to make four of them fast on a daily basis. Booker Ravitch is no stranger to Victory Lane, having worked alongside Rodney Childers as race engineer during Kevin Harvick's championship winning season in 2014, and then having success as a crew chief himself for first Clint Boyer and then Eric Almarola. He is without a doubt one of the smartest people in this building. And so to have him in a role to where he's a little bit more of a free thinker and has the ability to help the entire organization rather than limiting him to just focusing on one car is going to really help SHR. Mike's relevance is important on the competition management side just because he's kind of been in the grind on a week-to-week -week basis and understanding the evolution of the cars and, and the crew chiefs and people that have that confidence in Mike know that he knows what's going on and what's happening and being able to have that trust and belief. I think it'll be great. He's been on the crew chief side, he's been on the engineer side, and he can be a good liaison between us and NASCAR. Being able to put his technical skills and gather the race engineers and just bridge that gap between the competition side, the racetrack side, and the technology and just kind of marrying that all together. On race weekends, the Pennsylvania native is able to help deal with scrutineering and roam between the pit boxes. His good relationship with the race engineers and crew chiefs means he's a man in demand. When it comes to the racetrack, I'm living more in the now, working through problems that the teams have, contacting back to the shop, keeping in touch with NASCAR as well as Ford our OEM. So just trying to keep information flowing in a lot of different ways. And then at nights, trying to work with the teams and figure out what they're going to do next and where I can help. Bugga moving into a new role and seeing what he's done has been pretty incredible. And, and I knew that, you know, he's, he was our engineer on the four car when he won the championship. I know what he's capable of. I think he'll bring the engineers together more, have more meetings that are more meaningful, and you know he's going to be key uh, over the next couple of years. 2022 has been no easy ride for SHR, but Booker Ravitch helped get both Chase Briscoe and Kevin Harvick into the playoffs with three wins between them, and his new role looks to be paying off. I feel like I have a very good relationship with all the crew chiefs and all the race engineers, so that respect, I think, that I have for them and they have for me goes a long way. The communication's more open. They know I'm just there to help. They're not afraid to talk to me and ask questions and that, and that's what's kept me so busy is if I'm just looking at what I'm gonna go do, that's one thing, but they are coming to me with so many questions and asking opinions and those type of things, so it keeps me running pretty hard. <laughs> Time now to head on to the grid. 
We begin our September race roundup in Japan as the World Endurance Championship returned to Fuji for the first time in three years. And it was a triumphant homecoming for Toyota as they secured a 1-2 for the GR010 hypercars in the six-hour race. It was their eighth win in nine at Fuji and the championship scrap with rivals Alpine will be played out at the season finale in Bahrain. The IndyCar series came to an end at Laguna Seca, California, where last year's champion Alex Pelot won the final race, but third place was enough for Penske's Australian ace Will Power to secure an emotional second title. Will Power joined some very famous names as a two-time NTT IndyCar Series champion. Oh, man. That sounds surreal. Honestly, it cannot thank you guys enough. The Southern 500 at Darlington kicked off NASCAR's playoffs in September and it was a disastrous race for series leader Chase Elliott who crashed at the end of stage one. Chase Briscoe was unable to avoid him. Kevin Harvick's playoff hopes went up in flames on lap 275 and the winner was non-playoff contender Eric Jones, his second Southern 500 victory. A week later, another non-playoff winner at Kansas, this time Bubba Wallace who took his second career victory. And the Bristol night race continued the theme. Chris Buescher, another non-playoff driver, became the record equaling 19th different winner this season. Next up was Texas, and for the fourth consecutive race, victory went to a driver already out of playoff contention. Looking for career win number three, it's gonna come, and Texas, Tyler Reddick wins in the Lone Star State. Next up, Formula One's championship leaders swap race suits for wetsuits in Saint-Tropez. With sailing's 90-kilometer-an-hour foiling catamarans competing on the French Riviera, Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez couldn't resist heading along to experience the F1 of sailing, Sail GP. They are proper race boats, a lot of carbon involved, aerodynamics, the foils, um, yeah, there's a lot to it, and we get to experience that today. We're going to be doing some racing, but not on track. We're going to be today doing it on the water. I'm uh, really I'm curious about the sailing because, uh, yeah, it's the first time I'll do it. The Red Bull Aces were invited aboard the United States twin-hulled F50 to take on the Australian team in a full-speed demonstration race. It'll be fascinating to see what well, two guys that race the fastest cars in the world and now jump on the water and get their reactions and what the sensations are like in a race. We get to experience it, you know, in full race conditions. That is something I think which is already really nice because it's not very often that you can do these kind of things in competition. It's a great day as well, luckily a bit of wind around. Red Bull's visit spurred the US team to victory in Saint-Tropez, while the F1 drivers were also inspired. Max Verstappen winning the Italian Grand Prix the same weekend. It was nice, it was a really cool experience and then at one point you get a bit more comfortable as well in terms of how you're sitting, how you're just leaning in when they're turning and uh, you get a lot more confident in what you're doing, or at least trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> to end today we meet a veteran racer still putting the pedal to the metal with Porsche. After a 17-year career and countless race victories, Jörg Bergmeister stands tall amongst the ranks of Porsche factory drivers and he continues his long association with the German manufacturer today. Well, I started in go-karting. Uh, my grandfather already used to race motorcycles and my dad switched to cars, so I pretty much had no choice uh, but get involved in racing. I started karting when I was three. Then the natural progression was to Formula cars. At some point, I just got a bit too tall with 1 meter 94 and had to think of alternatives. So when I was 18, my dad put me in a cup car here at the Nürburgring, and I've been in all the generations of cup cars ever since. The veteran campaigner was brought in to help develop Porsche's latest cup racer, the 992, and no one could be better qualified. The first cup car I've driven was in 94, 964 Cup, my very first race when I was 18 in a Porsche. So I've driven all the generations uh, up to the 992 now. In general, the cups are a very good playing field for young drivers. There's a lot of professional drivers that started in cup and became then professional drivers. And I think it's probably the best place to be for a young driver to make a living in racing in, in GT cars. The foundations of Bergmeister's works career were laid in Porsche's one-make series in the early 2000s. Success led him to North America and five ALMS titles, three with long-term teammate Pat Long. 
the cup car definitely was a big part of my career. Without winning Carrera Cup and Super Cup, I would have never become a factory driver and would have never had all the success I had afterwards. Daytona, Sebring, Petit Le Mans, Laguna Seca, all those places, really special tracks. I always enjoyed racing in the States. Flying Lizard was an excellent team, driving with Pat. Really enjoyed working with them for that long period of time. We had lots of success in ALMS. Also winning Le Mans, there had been so many great races and fun races, uh, lots of success. Le Mans, Sebring, Daytona, Spa and the Nürburgring are among the Germans' list of classic endurance victories, many with the legendary Manti racing team. My association with Manti is, I don't even know for how many years, but I always enjoyed working with them. First with Olaf, now with the Raider brothers, really good connection. Every time I'm here at the ring, I at least stop by once for coffee, talk to all the guys that I obviously know from my racing career. They're really passionate about what they're doing every time they go out on track and trying to prove themselves over and over again. In a career that's come full circle, the 46-year-old now tests Porsche's latest road cars and acts as a brand ambassador. My first dream job was Porsche and now the second one. What I'm doing now is what I really like, developing the new road cars. It's what I always enjoyed in racing and now doing it for the road cars a bit is, is really a lot of fun. And it's a nice combination doing some PR stuff. So overall, I enjoy what I'm doing and I hope I can continue for some more years. Next time, under the hood of a top fuel dragster, and Verstappen on the Red Bull way. We'll see you then on Mobile One The Grid.